Do you remember what we learned back in Volume 1 on bifurcations? It's now time to recall that and update our information on that for the 2D systems that we're going to be working with. You might worry that things get really difficult when you move up a dimension, but when it comes to bifurcations, things are not so bad. In their simplest forms, we can look at all the bifurcations that we learned in 1D in a decoupled system and recover everything that we had there. This works in continuous or discrete time. In continuous time, you could write out the 2D system dx dt equals f of x and mu, where mu is your parameter, and let dy dt be linear. Let it be lambda times y for some constant lambda, that lambda, of course, being an eigenvalue. This is a decoupled system and will exhibit whatever one-dimensional bifurcations you've put into this. One can do the same thing in discrete time with a decoupled system. Now, either of these can be conjugated with a coordinate transformation that takes this local decoupled picture into a coupled setting. And that is going to exhibit the same bifurcations as in this decoupled one-dimensional system augmented with a linear second dimension. In general, we have the same story as in 1D. We have normal forms for the standard bifurcations. You may want to take a little bit of time and recall what those are. We have the same notion of co-dimension in terms of how many parameters are needed to unfold a bifurcation. You may want to recall that as well. So here we are, same story as 1D. What's different? Well, what's different is, of course, the way things look. Let's consider a saddle node bifurcation in continuous time. Presented in the normal form where we have a decoupled system with the bifurcation happening in X and then linear dynamics in Y. Depending on whether those linear dynamics are stable, lambda negative, or unstable, lambda positive, you have very different looking systems. On one side of the bifurcation, there's no equilibria. But on the other side of the bifurcation, where there's a pair of equilibria, what you have is one being a saddle and the other being either a sink or a source, depending on the value of this lambda. Now, that looks like a very different sort of bifurcation, but really what is happening in the x direction is exactly the same as what we always see in a saddle node bifurcation. In fact, hey, now that I come to think of it, that's a really weird name for a bifurcation, saddle node. What did that mean? Ah, now it makes sense. A node is old fashioned terminology for a source or a sink. And so a saddle node bifurcation really makes sense in the context of 2D, where you have a saddle and either a source or a sink coming together, colliding and annihilating. That's the explanation for the name. Now we've motivated our examination in terms of decoupled systems, but that's not really the complete story. What really matters is qualitative changes in the number or types of equilibria. What really matters is things like eigenvalues, it is possible to have bifurcations that cannot be decoupled in this way. For example, a pitchfork bifurcation in the plane can involve some equilibria that have complex eigenvalues, that have swirling sorts of behaviors. That doesn't decouple neatly. Nevertheless, you still have that fundamental pitchfork behavior where you go from one equilibrium to three equilibria. These come in, of course, subcritical and supercritical variants. Everything that you learned before still works. But what really matters is the qualitative changes and the number and types of equilibria. Moving to higher dimensions makes it a little richer and a little more interesting, but the same types of bifurcations come about.